Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Sir Bob Geldof in conversation with ABC TV's Big Ideas presenter, Waleed Ali. Welcome, everybody. Welcome to Australia, Bob. Thanks, Waleed. How are you doing? Uh, a bit groggy. Yep. Yep, got in last night, came from a beautiful summer's day in London to kissing rain. Do, yeah. do they have those in London? I no. I wasn't aware. <laughs> um, I, I, I want to start by marking the fact that it's, what, about 30-odd years, 31 years? 30 years. 30 years since we had the whole Band Aid and then Live Aid yep. phenomenon. <clears throat> and what that was trying to address is to do with poverty in Africa, which is an intractable problem, a seemingly intractable problem entwined with corruption, and then the AIDS epidemic is part of that story as well. Mm. So the problem doesn't seem to be going anywhere. Why do you think that is? Um, well, I disagree with you, which is a good start. Um, um, the two are intertwined in my head, but they're specifically intertwined um, in relation to poverty. And I, I really do see uh, um, the epidemic as being aligned closely with them. Um, is symptomatic of the greater malaise, which is poverty. And before I got to um, Band-Aid, and the first time I was aware of AIDS was when um, I was in New York in about 83 or 84, the same year as Band-Aid happened, and some friends were becoming ill. And uh, those of us who are of my age and my generation will remember the terror um, that we felt just what is this thing, you know? And again, if you're your age, you won't quite understand the cultural shock that was to our part of the world. Uh, remember that I'm in a rock and roll band, so, um, you know, shagging was part of the entire whole great thing about it, you know? And, it's in the job description. It's, and it yeah. still is, and for every young man. Um, uh, and suddenly you're suddenly aware that this has consequences besides the other normal ones that were associated with it. And, um, but beyond that, there was a complete confusion about exactly what is this thing? Where does it stop? Where does it go? So there was very little association with um, poverty. It was more to do with lifestyle. And then there was, you know, the... Again, for people, my it's very hard for people who weren't around then to kind of get it. There was um, a sort of, for, for the, a lot of people, there's a sort of vindication that this is what the gay lifestyle led to. It's your fault, yourselves, and see what's happening. It's God visiting this upon you, which led to this repulsion amongst normal people. And that's where I began to feel that this was getting serious. And when Francoise then identified what this was, then a focus, a real practical focus on this thing happened. So now we move forward to me looking at television in October and seeing 30 million people about to die of want, of famine. And um, so we did the record. And um, I went to Africa because it became a phenomenon which I hadn't anticipated, but now we had a lot of money. And when I was walking amongst these um, almost human looking humans that I, I thought it's not enough this thing we're doing. We have to talk about it now to the rest of the world. And so that was the idea of Live Aid because what we're, what we're witnessing is um, 30 million people potentially dying of want in a world of surplus. That wasn't only intellectually absurd, it was uh, economically illiterate, and it was morally repulsive. But more to the point, the issue was that famine, lack of health, and lack of education were only symptomatic of a greater malaise, and that malaise is poverty. Poverty is a singular condition of economics. If it's economics, it must be dealt with politically. And so that's what Live Aid was for me. It was, yes, immediately getting as much money as possible to stop as many people dying immediately as possible. Tell everyone about it. We can nail this on the head. But more 
to get the numbers up so we could create a political lobby of scale that would over time uh, eliminate the problem. Can, can I just draw you on the poverty dimension of it though because you write a really moving chapter in, in the book on your experience in Africa and there's this really moving chapter on the parade of dying yep. and it begins with this really horrific story of a prostitute who's making the choice not to have safe sex. Yeah. And you explain why that is as a way of telling us the dimensions of this problem that we don't yeah. understand. Share that with us now. Uh, well, I was, <clears throat> I was on the road um, in Congo where um, this little, this nasty little fucker escaped from the jungles and it was, everyone believes, happened over time. I was in the, um, the ruined laboratories. I think, I forget now, but was it in Kisangani? Where they probably first found what AIDS was, Belgian doctors, when it was a Belgian colony. And I saw some of the slides. I mean, this, this is a ruined university. I mean, totally ruined. I mean, like bombed out things, but people still go to class there. And the files are protected by one guy, and they're all, I mean, I'm talking to the constituency, so you probably have seen this or been there or known it, but the files are in these metal cases, and they're really, like, uh, they're not in good shape, but they need to be. And they showed me one slide that they think might be from somebody in 1931, that they now think this may be AIDS, but they've certainly got one from the 50s, which they're almost certain is AIDS. So gradually, this thing got out. And it was specifically taken out on the one major transcontinental road across the Congo, across Botswana, or not Botswana, Burundi, Rwanda, all there, <coughs> over to the east. And the truckers along the way, you know, like truckers anywhere on these long distances, have long overnight stays, they're exhausted, they stop. And of course, there's hookers and shanties all along that route to provide for the truckers food, accommodation, women, etc. And when, this, when AIDS became known for what it was, um, a lot of people, of course, rejected the fact that they had it and that it would make no difference to them. Others just accepted they had it and that they would die. And there's this, again, those of you who know, often people talk about this African fatalism, which, thank God, is disappearing, not just with regard to AIDS, but with regard to everything. Um, and... Uh, the prostitutes who insisted on um, their client wearing a condom, you know, um, really got very little business. And the women who accepted sex without a condom could, could, could name their price. And um, they were the ones doing the business. And uh, it was shocking, like when I spoke to them, um, the women, they said, well, you know, what can I do? I mean, um, I've got the kids, I've got the this, and, you know, again, I know I'm talking to people who know this part of the world very well, but you have to imagine those who don't. You have to imagine these uh, diesel pumping machines that barely function uh, on this tarmacadamed road that is full of potholes and shanties on the side and open sewers down the drains of the road that are this, this size. It's just awful. And, you know, when I say that the spread of this pandemic is to do with poverty, that is precisely it. And, you know, when you silo these separate things, lack of health, lack of education, um, the inability to distribute ARVs. You are talking about a singular condition. And the condition of poverty is so unnecessary. It's so stupid, really. I mean, we've seen it over the course of the GFC, that how we get out of this mess is by bringing the 50% of the world who live on less than $2 a day. You cannot live on less than $2 a day. You can't do it. And 40% of that 50% live on less than $1 a day. That's impossible. And so if you want a functioning global economy, and it doesn't function, and it is global, then you need to bring that 50% of the planet into the global economic common wheel. 
because if they can produce and earn income, they buy our stuff, which keeps us in, in jobs. If what's a we can buy their stuff, then you get a balance. That's possible. And Africa, of the 10 fastest growing economies in the planet today, right now, seven are African. So your first question about nothing has changed, well, that's wrong because we know that um, the whole um, scenario with regard to HIV has changed completely in the 30 years we've talked about, completely. And if you can say that any other time in history where a lethal global pandemic has suddenly appeared on the streets of New York, which is, I think, where we first recognized it, 30 years ago, to almost getting, almost nearly almost getting to the point where this thing can be eliminated. 30 years from not knowing what it was? I mean, the human ingenuity. I mean, it, it, it is staggeringly brilliant what you know, not bigging you guys up, but what, the, what this constituency has achieved. It's never happened before. Never happened before. And that's the first thing. And therefore, the, the scandal underlying all of this is the preposterous reluctance to fund the last mile. That is what is so disgraceful about this this today. I can take you back to that moment, though, when you were talking to those women. Yep. There's this really, I found it an impossibly confronting exchange that you had with them where you said, it was like you were informing them that, that AIDS is deadly and yeah. that they are at risk of this. And but that they knew that. And Yes, and this is the thing that I thought was interesting, is that the calculations that people in this position had to make like, explain what those were, but also your reaction when you first encountered that. But it, it's, it's not so much what they have to make, it's the calculations on a daily basis that the poor must make. And um, to that point, I was in Ghana last week, and um, I was talking to... Um, hold on, let me get this straight. As I said, I'm a little fuzzy. I was talking to... Um, a woman, um, where was I? I mean, I think it was a cafe or something, you know? So, um, and uh, for some reason it came up that she hadn't eaten that day. And I said, well, why not? And she said, well, I don't earn enough money. Now this, like, I, I guess this happened in our own histories, in our own countries, that you calculate the days you can eat. Oh, no, I know where I was. I was up country. I was visiting a, a, a fruit factory, which is an amazing place. But, um, and I was out on the farms. And you're on a farm, <laughs> massively productive, but the person hadn't eaten that day. And I said, well, how many days a week do you go without food? And she said, two on average. So this is calculated into the, the, the weekly schedule. And... Um, See, I get angry. That's the problem with me. I'm a paddy and my, my, my first instinct is rage. And, you know, that doesn't have to be like that. The point is it shouldn't be like that and it doesn't have to be. And with these um, women in the Congo, it was that calculus of poverty that is so brutal on the psyche. I mean, how do you ever get out of that? If that is your daily calculation that I need to feed my children, keep them alive. Uh, we can eat three days a week. Um, that means that I have to fuck these men who will be killing me. Um, but I'll probably live, which was our point, even if I do get it, I know that I'll be able to live for X amount of time, which should see the kids right. Um, I suppose in a bizarre way, most humans act like that, most parents do. You know, I'll get this job, we'll improve the lifestyle. Um, you know, the kids are then given a, a platform to a better life. And, uh, you know, if I'm fired or that, then the calculus is they have less of a better life. I suppose that's the benign calculation we make in our part of the world. Hers is a, let, a lot more stark. And um, the, the thing, again, 
as I'm saying this to you now, let me tell you that there's a, a little worm inside here getting more and more angry um, that that should be the case. It really, really, truly need not be the case. Do we, um... Is that anger helpful? Do we need it? Do we yeah, need more of it? it's very helpful. You know, I've got a very um, primitive emotional system. Anger. That's it. You, know? <laughs> <laughs> you were talking before about the growing economies in Africa and the need yeah. to in integrate them into the world economy so yeah. for mutual benefit. Yeah. And this is often an argument that's deployed against increasing aid. Mm. So the idea that aid, particularly the aid that's going into Africa, isn't helping. Corruption gets in the way, it's mm. siphoned off, it doesn't go to the people who need it, mm. and that should actually be reduced so that we should instead focus on the economic side of things. Yeah, What's well that, your reaction to that? Well, it's not true, that's the first thing. Um, you know, for, for example, the Australian government promised uh, to get to um, ODA levels of 0.5 of the economy. Remember, you are in one of the richest countries in the world, despite your own problems, despite the people feel the pinch, etc., the GFC. Um, but you are one of the richest, like Britain. <clears throat> and um, Britain achieved its target, um, which is should be a matter of great pride for uh, the British and the government. And they achieved it because over three consecutive governments, Blair, Brown and Cameron, so Labour and, and, and Conservative, they kept to something they felt was legitimate, but that was because of activist pressure and because people in Britain said, we don't have a problem with it, even through the worst of austerity. And, and um, you know, the, the Conservative papers were railing against the cost of ODA, but as it turned out, they weren't right because the British economy is the fastest growing in the Western world right now, and still the levels are at an all-time high. So they kept to their political promise. You know, when, when politicians do that, I find it very hard to be cynical about the process in the teeth of wild opposition, frenzied opposition from the people who just don't get it. Um, over here, I find it less compelling, your arguments. I, I was dismayed by uh, Gillard's refusal to up it, though, uh, and now, you know, Abbott made it part of his, his election that they would cut back aid, and so they've kept that promise. But the point is, when a government makes a promise, regardless of its political stripe, it is not signing the name of the Prime Minister of the day to that promise. It is signing the sovereign will of the people to that promise. It's signing the name of the Australian people. It isn't up to the individual in or out of power to chuck that up in the air and to abuse it. And that's what creates the cynicism. The Australian people gave their word to the poorest people on this planet, to the poorest people. You can't mess with your sovereign promise to the poor. They're too vulnerable. They're too weak. It's like beating up an infant. You can't fuck around with your political promise. And and, and, and the, the get out of jail card for free is that, well, they're all doing great now, so we stop it. They're doing great now because you helped them. You gave them a loan. You said, here's a Here's something to help you get going. And so what charity does in a basic way is, what charity is, and NGOs really dislike the word charity. And I can kind of see why, because it's become devalued in our postmodern world. You know, I don't know about it in Australia, but in, in, in England, when the DJs talk about charity, they put it in those you know, awful postmodern ironic quotes. They go, and you can almost see them going like this, they go, charity, and they put on a sort of Barry White type, he, charity, <laughs> voice. But it, it's actually weird, because they also talk about the word love in the same way. They can't say it straight. There's something stopping them, like there's some cynical or sceptical view or ironic view about love. They go, hey, love, you know, they go like that. And here are two fundamental words that describe um, the human condition. And if you see a human being hurt, and you see it on television or you see something, if you see them hurt, or you're on the street and 
you see some sentient, intellectual, momentarily challenged fellow person on the street, and you don't feel um, some response, then I genuinely believe something inside you will wither and die. It's not spiritual, it's something to do with something other. And we know for a fact that tens and hundreds of millions of people around the world on a daily basis consistently respond to the pain of others. That's charity. And what happens is the individual or the family say, you know what, no, not in my name. And the most they can do is put their hand in the pocket and give a buck or a pound or a yen or a dollar or whatever euro into the Oxfam or Save the Children box. That's the most they can do. But it is a lot. And where it's very powerful is if we all gave a dollar into Oxfam. That's powerful because that means whatever the 14,000 at this conference will probably keep 14,000 individuals going for another day or two. That's powerful. What's really powerful is when a million do it, because that's political. Politics are numbers. What made Live Aid powerful was not the hundreds of millions of dollars for aid, was the billions watching. That's what made it powerful. So a million people respond, and politicians go, whoa. Okay. Now, it's politically risk-free to cut ODA. But if the entire country said, excuse me, you put our name down as being good for this cash to that weakest person in the planet, do it. Then it would hurt them, and that's what happened in England. That's charity. ODA is different. ODA seeks to make government coherent, because unless you have coherent government, you can't run a state. If you can't run a state, then you won't get the institutions that require health and education at a basic level. It also supports the community at the community level, charity the individual and the family, one human to another, one family to another. ODA, the community level, a basic health education, primary agricultural level, so that a kid can go to school, learn basic numeracy and literacy, be basically healthy and have enough basically to eat a couple of days a week. If the state can cohere above that, and there's that void between the community and the state, which is the economy. You need then to get in there and grow an economy. When that begins happening, then you get coherence. Then you begin to get primary health functions, institutions that support um, electoral responsibility, and you begin to do away with um, corruption. Having said that, you guys focus on Asia. 13% corruption GDP in China. Yet we beg we plead, we crawl in our belly towards the golden gleam of money in China. The most authoritarian regime, the most repressive, the ones that sling journalists into jail, human rights activists who deny all this stuff. We beg, we plead to get in there. We'll do anything to be with them. Corruption Southeast Asia, 11% in general. You know, it goes on. Corruption continentally in Africa is 6 to 7%. Six to seven percent too much? Of course. But the moment that you start getting where it's not worth the while, where it's actually more worthwhile to be earning your proper income through investment, through trade, then you seem to see levels decreasing. So there's two kinds of corruptions here. There is very little corruption with the misuse of um, AIDS funding or, with the mis or outright theft of antiretrovirals. There's very little of that. Where there would be corruption is failed health systems as a result of failed governance, as a result of poverty. That's one. And the second one is the corruption of politics in our countries where your word means nothing. Why do you think that is the case? Why is it that a government can cut foreign aid, not meet promises that it's made. As I said, there's, we, we just talked about it backstage, So, and I asked uh, one of the organisers here, and she said there's no political risk, there's no political downside. The funds are so small, the money's so small to us, mm. that, you know, it's neither here nor there. But as a token, 
You see, you know, I, I traveled with Bush throughout Africa. And Bush really was the president who made radical changes in terms of what America would do for Africa. It was him who came up with PEPFAR or his administration, which is a very effective um, method of, you know, dealing with the problem. Um, and uh, I said, look, Mr. President, why don't you talk about what America's doing here, the proper Jeffersonian view of what America's kind of meant to do. You know, he, he kept wanting to talk about Iraq and I just wouldn't go there. My thing was to focus on Africa, you know. And, you know, and, he, and I kept saying, look, I'm not going to talk about that. You and I are going to disagree. So let's just talk about, you know, like, and my opinion is no more valid than the guy in the bar, but I do know Africa. After 30 years, I know it. So let's do that one. And I said, why don't you talk about it in your State of the Union address? You know? And he said, look, Gellof, if I talk about building a bridge in Nairobi, they'll just say, why didn't you build it in Nebraska? You know? And that's it. So ODA, if a Bishop decides to up ODA and Abbott agrees to it, a large constituency here in the press and that's where I say, but what about our problems there? Why aren't you spending the money there? What's it got to do with us? What's happening there? Well, I'll tell you what it's got to do with you. Australian mining is one of the big, big investments that your country makes. It's huge. The Australian miners are all over Africa. The money it brings into your economy is vast, vast, far times greater than any ODA you'll ever give. Your future is as much, not as much, obviously your futures depend on the Chinese economy as well for the moment until you decide to, you know, uh, which is why you crawl up their arse at every available opportunity, you know. But, um, but you've got huge investments there. And, you know, you've got huge responsibilities as a result. And it's not very well known, you know, how big your investments are. Canada are the same. And Canada has just dropped its funding to the Global Fund. How dare they? How dare they? And, like, I could go on about what your companies get up to in Africa. I could go on about the reluctance to sign the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative. That's a form of corruption. I could go on about the American uh, petrol companies who are now trying to take this let this critical legislation to court, you know, with their own lobby group. I mean, this is a corruption. Why do you want to keep secret what we pay these governments? Why? Because who are you, who are you wedging up? You know, what do you think keeps the Congolese government in place? Possibly, and I use the term advisedly, allegedly, <laughs> Australian mining companies and Canadian mining companies and American petrol companies and the rest of them. They're all up to it. Allegedly. Uh, no, they're all up to us. Right. <laughs> if all of that's true and there's still no price, there's still no political cost associated with turning a blind eye to that, um, reducing, at the very least, the, the promised growth in our aid budgets... That suggests, doesn't it, that there's something missing in the advocacy, that the advocacy is not achieving... That's a really good point. So um, what is it that's missing? It's not missing from the advocates themselves. It's that you get tired of it. You get tired, like, uh, I, uh, look, all I've ever done all my life is sort of market my ideas, OK? And it's, the advocacy thing is, is a problem because you get very tired of coming back to the same well, because the same well is very tired of hearing the same message, does it ever get better? Well, the answer is yes, it does. And the advocates then go crazy because they say the media gives out the wrong message, you know, and they should be telling these stories of, you know, that it's all happening and stuff like that. Now, the latest research suggests that that's true, that actually people want to see that what's been happening is good, but it makes for lousy news. You know, everything's great. Well, what's the news there, you know? Everything's shit, that's news, you know? Um, yeah, you're right, it is shit, like, you know? And, um, well, except that it actually becomes less news when you've heard it a million times before. It does, and... Um, you so, so maybe the positive result would be news if it was unexpected. Well, I think, I think you know, 
Your first question was the usual one about it doesn't get better, what's changed in 30 years? And like if you look at, as I've said, the fact from the discovery of what this beast is to its... I mean, this, this, you know, I think Clinton called it this movement. I'm not sure it is. I'm not sure it's even a crusade. It was just the recognition that we could beat this and that in 30 years we're kind of almost possibly nearly there. That's extraordinary progress. Secondly, in 30 years, these countries prostrate in front of the world on the news cameras are now amongst the fastest, from a very low base, from one of the fastest growing economies in the world. That's massive progress. The MDGs, the Millennium Development Goals, many of them have been achieved. Having, you know, made a joke about China, can I say, you know, I think the greatest triumph so far of our century has been the pulling of 400 million people out of extreme poverty in China through trade. That's extraordinary. And so the MDGs are being achieved by default. You know, and again, you've got to go back to these terrible acronyms, MDGs, oh God, here we go, you know, Millennium Development Goals. What even does Millennium Development Goals mean? Most people don't know it. But actually, what it is, is that very elegantly, mankind decided to give the gift to itself of saying, within 15 years, here's what we're going to do. We're going to take out half of the extremely poor in the planet. We're going to do that. We're going to set ourselves that task and we're going to do it starting now. That's our millennial gift to ourselves. That's a fantastic notion. The truth is, it may almost be achieved. The reality is, why did you make it half? Why didn't you say all of them? Because that's what's doable. Okay? It was potentially doable. We won't have half, but we'd have done a lot. And the next step is, how do we now advance that? Because as I say, that is the end object for all our sakes. There are less wars. All resource wars are resource wars. The poor want some of the stuff that we don't allow them to have. And I say we don't allow them, it sounds activisty, but literally we don't. We don't have free trade. We've got massive subsidies and tariffs that prevent the poor from accessing our markets. You know, all that stuff goes on. So these things get rewritten as we go, but certainly, Achieving the end of poverty is truly possible, just as achieving the end of AIDS is almost upon us. You ask for 30 years, boy, tell me another period of human history where that has been set as a target and almost achieved. Pretty good. Well, so one of the goals is to halt or reverse the spread of HIV AIDS by, yeah. by 2015. Mm. Um, it's good to hear your optimism. Are you optimistic enough to think that Well, I, I, I talk myself into optimism, like, you know... Um, if I'm by myself, I'm going, everything shit, you know. Okay. And, um, well, and you're, you're amongst friends now, so you yeah. can be as optimistic as you like. No, I, I think everybody here is absolutely, you know, knows exactly the challenges. So do you think we'll meet that goal? But, you know, this thing about the beginning of the end of AIDS was achieved uh, from the 2013 figures, where there were, um, you know, less people who were... Uh, eff uh, affected, then we're, we're getting new people getting treatments. I think it was 2.3 to 2.1 million. And they see that as the beginning of the end of the epidemic. Uh, genuinely, obviously, the entire world hopes so. If they think about it, they hope so. But the problem is now that it's, you know, of the top 20 places uh, where it's continuing, uh, where AIDS can, our countries, 19 are in Africa. That's another reason why people can long finger this, they just go, Africa, it's hopeless. It's not. Um, they can say, well, Africans, like, it's all weird. The culture is so weird, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, it, it's not, you know. I mean, millions of people have traveled to Africa. You know it's not weird. Um, so, uh, but, you know, the media, the media thing, and I, look, it's, you can blame the media too easily, but it's what we want to see. You know, we want to see tribal people jumping up and down and doing their dances and the jewellery and the faces. And I did a documentary for the BBC in, in uh, 05 before the Glen Eagles G8. And there was a sh I was in Uganda in Kampala and um, I shot people in the supermarket going to church and then going to the supermarket, do their week shopping and then going to the bowling alley in their suit and ties and things. And the editor came into the cutting room and he said, he said, what's that about? And I said, what? And he goes, bowling. And I said, yeah. He goes, what's well, Africans bowling? I said, yeah, that's the point. 
Like, and he said, what's the point? And I said, they go fucking bowling, that's the point, you know? <laughs> and like... And like, you know, and, and uh, he said, well, where's all the, you know, the spears and the stuff, you know? And I said, and like, he walked out and um, he sort of resigned from the project because this was going to be boring telly. Not enough you know? spears. And, uh, you know, so he had not enough spears. And um, so, uh, you know, that's the problem for, for the media. How do, re how do you relay this story? And even if you tell the business story, like, CNN, God bless, made a brave report, you know, and now everyone's getting in it with the Africa business. But it's all about Mrs. Miggins and her jewellery making concern, you know, where she sits at home. That's not it at all. You know, I mean, you're talking about proper serious business. And in fact, the reality of the situation, let me be absolutely clear, is that you must consider that Europe, still bizarrely the richest country, continent on the planet, is eight miles from the poorest. Eight miles. In the, if you're a capitalist, in that is your opportunity. In that tiny little gap of eight miles, go to Tarifa in southern Spain where all the beautiful young boys and girls are surfing at sunset. And as the sun dips down, watch the fires of Africa come alight. Just over there, you'll see them. You know, I mean, it's extraordinary. And like in that tiny gap is all our baleful past and all our future opportunity. And we've been negotiating with this vast continent forever. I mean, you know, the Romans were, most of North Africa was a Roman colony. We've always been backwards and forwards, as we are today, viz the Australian mining companies. And we're in the middle of a food shock. We're in the middle of a food crisis, and it ain't going away. 10 billion people by uh, 2100. <clears throat> consumption going up 1,480%. How? How? Inflation is created by the food in our supermarkets right now. We're going to Africa because the last remaining 60% of arable land in our planet is in Africa. Whether Bishop or Abbott know it, Australia will be going to Africa along with the rest of the world. When I wrote Feed the World, in 1984, that chorus line, I didn't actually expect that it would be Africa doing it, but do it a will. Mm. Uh, by 2040, Africa will be seriously, properly, mark my words, one of the polar centers of economic activity in the planet. It has no other choice, and neither do we. Is economic activity going to be enough? I mean, take the example of uh, South Africa, for example. Yeah. Uh, very strong... Uh, antiretroviral drug program, but also very high infection rates. Mm. So what's below the economic growth story that we need to come to terms with? Culture um, is one of them. The, you've, you can't imagine, except the people in this room know it, is the level of resistance at a cultural level from uh, many, of, many of these countries and, and their societies, you know, uh, with regard to the fact it's to do with sex, it's to do with um, being unhealthy and therefore unable to work, all these things. I mean, it's, it's no accident that rates are still rising in South Africa and Nigeria, for example, because the migrant worker level between the two is huge. Um, that Africa resists, South Africa resisted acknowledging AIDS I mean, it's extraordinary that Tabo Mbeki, who was uh, an intellectual, uh, you know, a highly educated man, refused to acknowledge. I mean, you know, I met the guy privately, sitting rooms and stuff, you know, had long conversations, you know, talked absolute nonsense about AIDS. Part even of it was privately? To, so he didn't acknowledge it even no, privately? No, privately. Part of it was to do with the fact that they were ashamed and this, this really I found out in the Congo and everything, they were ashamed that, you know, all this negative stuff about Africa, which they don't really understand because they're living it. They're living Africa. They are Africans. This, this perception which, you know, they resent and, dis and hate. And suddenly now they're being blamed for this new thing. Thanks very much, guys. Now what's it we're being blamed for this. And that was part of the resistance in Nigeria where the imams refused to allow people 
to um, you know, accept antiretrovirals. Polio was another one. They blamed the CIA and the Belgians for testing out um, uh, AIDS as a weapon of war sometime, I think, in the 50s and 60s, hence the, their keeping of the, 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 the files. And um, you know, they still insist that's the case, that this was a plot, and that's really behind it. And that has got great purchase in Africa, and indeed in South Africa, less so now, but still nonetheless, and in the Muslim-controlled parts of northern Nigeria, for example, it still holds sway in, in, in huge areas. It's a nonsense, but there you go. Um, is that a question of culture, or is that really a question of humiliation and politics? It's both, and where the two meet, it's a very good point, where the two meet, it's a toxic mix, because you can use it to fuel resistance in every sense, you know, um, cultural political and economic resistance. So in South Africa, then, you, got this, you get uh, Zuma coming along, telling you to have a shower if you've got AIDS. I mean, this is, this is such an abrogation of responsibility and leadership. It is terrifying. And yet, what's it, you know, within the circle in which he inhabits? I mean, you know, you've got these people in the ANC who are highly, highly intelligent, and they're just going, but he needs to get elected president. And so he will appeal to a constituency that is embarrassed or ashamed or don't know about HIV or who want to shut up about it. So when the miners come home after their nine-month stints, of course they've been, they've been out with hookers. Of course they bring it home. And African women, in general, cannot refuse sex. They just cannot refuse it to their husbands are the massive amounts of rape. So this is to do with the status of women, which is changing, but you know, it's to do with all of these cultural artifacts. And then the churches, the fundamentalist churches, you know, who won't have anything to do with uh, homosexuality or anything like that. You know? So stigma is part of this. Stigma is a huge thing. You know, and, uh, is that changing at all? Of course, it can change because I go back to you know, me first finding this with my friends, uh, coming into contact with it with my friends in New York. The stigma attached to it was horrendous. The fear, Ooh, you know, don't touch it. It is beginning to change, but it's education and the fact that this doesn't have to kill you. When it did inevitably kill you, the turning away from those people was enormous. And so, you know, it, it, it's less so now, but the thing you always have to remember again, like, you know, of course I'm talking to like-minded people who know this stuff backwards. The thing is it takes out the young. It takes out the most productive parts of the economy. So even if, you know, you, the humanitarian aspect, the horror of it, I mean, you really have to see it to see the horror of this. The productive capacity of these people is eliminated and has really set back the South African economy very much because, you know, it's the young who are sexually active. And then they leave behind orphans and the old. And so the old um, at least are given, you know, the old are very much respected still in that culture. And they were given a kind of new lease of life almost to take care of these kids. But then again, you know, there were families and this, is, this became a small phenomenon. But if... Um, you know, a man took a second wife, then the second wife almost, you know, almost normally threw out the children of the first wife who became feral children. The girls became hookers, the guys became thugs, um, or else they became these famous, these witch children and stuff like that, because that was the only way they could live. And then you, I've been in these places where, these schools where they exercise the demons, and of course the kids go along with this bullshit, because it means they're getting a bed and they're getting something to eat. You know, it's, it sounds like some terrible dystopian vision of a future. In fact, it's a vision of the past, because a lot of that has been eliminated as more and more they just see it as a, as, a, as a health concern that can be dealt with. I'm conscious of the fact that we're having this conversation, which has now delved um, quite boldly into African culture, and there's two people on stage. I have African heritage, haven't spent much time there. You don't have African heritage, have spent a lot of time there. Uh, and so we necessarily have some kind of distance from the place that we're talking about. But you still have to understand, you see, you started off with the misconception about poverty and corruption doing all this. It's there, of course, you know, that nothing changes. No, in fact, it's probably the most dynamic place where the status quo has been changed constantly. 
Um, and uh, you, you've got to remember that these countries have existed, I think, for no more the oldest than 60 years. 60 years. Dude, in Europe, we're still shooting down planes over the same nonsense about where borders are. We're still having massacres in Europe, in Yugoslavia, about ethnicity. After 650 years, the nation state still hasn't become anything coherent. Indeed, we've almost reached the end of the possibility of the nation state as the interdependent world becomes clearer. And yet in Africa, after only 60 years, where you were told this rectangle is your state, yeah, but what about these mountains? Forget the fucking mountains, this is it, you know? And I say, but those people over there speak a different language to us and they've got a different policy, a different economy, a different, different jokes to us. And these people here where the river is, forget the river, yeah, but they've got a different thing. doesn't matter, you're a state. Really? Okay. What's that? Yeah, well, whatever you can make of it. And what they've made of it are, um, is miraculous. I'm not an African apologist. But when you, what they've made of it, in general, is pretty miraculous. It took Australia a long time to be the lucky country. It took a long time. You had to work, and you inherited the institutions of a democracy. It doesn't work. Just wealth doesn't give you democracy. You need the institutions that can make it cohere. Look at Hong Kong, look at mainland China, that argument that's going on now. So, so the, the question I was going to ask, though, was given that we, okay, there is this dynamism with Af within Africa, no denying it. Uh, we have a distance from the continent necessarily by virtue of who we are and the circumstances of our lives. You, with the Live Aid experience, would have encountered over and over this allegation, for better or worse, of the, the, you know, the white saviour complex, this yeah. idea that we will rescue them. How do you negotiate that? And how do you think that all of us who have a distance from this continent should negotiate that? I don't negotiate it at all. You can fuck off, you know. <laughs> I mean, uh, yeah. Um, I, you know, it's nothing to do with saviour stuff. Um, there are black saviour complexes as well, you know. I mean, um, uh, it's, it's, a, it's, it's misdefining. It's to sort of make light of or to make cynical something that is possible. I mean, um, I just didn't like the fact that um, 30 million people were about to die in agony. Uh, where the argument, the political argument at the time, certainly in Europe, was <clears throat> the amount of surplus we were producing. Um, you won't be aware of it, but like there's... Um, there were butter mountains, there were wine lakes, they were calling them. And this was the result of the common agricultural policy, which came into being after the Second World War so that the continent could feed itself. But those subsidies still exist. And those subsidies, 40% uh, of all European taxes go to the common, to the cap it's called. But they prevent farmers to the south from exporting to us. So that these aren't the exact figures, but they're, 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 they're uh, an example. You can export your pineapples but we'll charge you X amount of tax. If you export your pineapple chunks, it will add 30% tax. If you, if you export your juice, we'll add 70% tax. So we price them out of the place so that they don't compete with us and we keep them enmeshed in poverty. So it is in us and them. And like, I'd be doing this, dude, if, if there were 30 million people about to die in hunger in Iceland, I'd have done the same. I'd have done the same if they were orange colored. You know, it is a matter of an academic matter to me that they're colour black and that it's in Africa. It doesn't have to be that way. Things do not have to be the way we're told they are. The world is not immutable. Things change on an hour by hour basis. The thing is to get in and sort of help to steer that. I was in pop music, so I had access to people like you. I could gas on about it and because I'm a paddy I had the words you know so that's it it's very simple you know <laughs> <laughs> well let me pick up that theme and the idea of activism the, the future of activism in this area and advocacy yeah because the world is a very different one now from the the world that where you first started doing mm. this 30 years ago it's a world that's awash with images where 
news and ideas and stories just sort of wash past us at a rate we can't yeah. even keep up with. Does that present an impossible challenge? Like, how, do you, how would you react to that if you were starting now rather than 30 years ago? What it, would does, you do? it does present, um, beyond what we're all talking about in this room and what you've just asked, it does present a terrible problem that everything just washes by us. It's all so huge and so impermanent that what I've noticed of my kids is that there's a locking into their own circle and their own concerns uniquely almost. And so when people criticise Angelina Jolie or Brittany or whomever, um, they're sort of missing the point. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll talk to the Brittany thing specifically because... You know, this was a kid raised specifically to be a star, almost. And she gets there and then activist types say, can we use this leverage you have into the average child's mind to talk about something that maybe you're bothered about? And Brittany kind of goes, well, what is it? And it's, it's breast cancer. And they will then outline to her, you know, the figures. And she then lends her name to wearing the pink ribbon thing. Now, you can't say that that's meaningless, except that my four girls went and had their breasts checked because of Brittany. Thanks, Brittany. You know, would they have done it if Dad had said, I think you should be aware of this? God, she took breasts, stood up. It's Dad talking about it, you know. <laughs> you know? Um, do you know what I mean? Even if Dad's a pop star, I would have thought you'd have been able to... Yeah, they, go, they just go lame when I say <laughs> pop star, you know. Uh, um, but uh, it's... Um, and, like, I really did... That's where it struck me that naff as this is, it's not naff of her to do it. Thanks, kid, you know. And, uh, and then there are very serious people like Jolie deeply serious about this, deeply, deeply serious, you know, more serious about this, because like politicians who are in the aid department, and I've had this conversation with a lot of them, where they've gone, you know, I've contacted them and said, uh, you know, I bet you it's the last thing you wanted to do, you know, because most of them want to be engaged in national politics. And I said, but I'm telling you this, and this is true, you mightn't get another gig, or this might be a launch platform to greater political glory. But either which way, it's probably the only job you have where you will directly have an, an immediate impact on someone's life. You can actually say, I did that. I did that. You know, everything else, it's in the balance. But when I leave this job, I actually did that. This thing I asked for, this thing called power that I asked for, I used it to keep that person going. Not bad. And they do become obsessed with and passionate about it. Someone like um, Angelina Jolie studies this, makes sure they know. And I, I watched Kira Knightley. Uh, did I watch her here? I don't know. Anyway, on, 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 I doubt if I'd watch her. Probably. Um, but uh, I heard her saying that I think UNICEF or... SCF had taken her out to the refugees in South Sudan. And she was very, very upfront about it. And she said, I, look, I'd never thought about refugees. I heard the word. I knew there was refugees in Africa, sort of South Sudan. What's that, you know? And she said, it doesn't actually matter where it is. It doesn't matter that they're refugees. It's when I was put in front of a woman whose husband had died on the road to safety. And she said, I didn't know how to talk to this woman. She seemed so alien to me in her poverty and odd clothes and misery and the, the surroundings. She said, so I just one woman to another, I just said, what do you miss about your husband? And she said, um, I miss the way he held me. I miss the way he made my children laugh. And suddenly it becomes so awfully, tragically, and beautifully human. And um, she didn't say that, but she said she was speechless in the face of recognition. She didn't say that, but that is what she meant. 
and <laughs> and um, the woman said, "Who are you?" So now they were talking as humans, not a very rich, beautiful girl in movies and this desolate woman who had to take care of children in possible violent conditions. And Kira said, I just didn't know what to say. It seemed that what she did was so irrelevant. Of course, it's not irrelevant because she's an actress and that's important and that's her job and that's what she wants to do. But in, in the face of this, it seemed so ridiculous. And um, she said, I'm somebody who's going to go back and get as much money for you and all these people here as I humanly can. Now you can diss that all you like, but fair play, Kira. And I'm with her, I'm not against a daily fucking male who writes some horrible article about her for suddenly recognizing that she can do something, park the acting, use the celebrity, this stupid thing, and use that to keep that woman and her children. She'll never be able to make her husband hold her again. She'll never be able to make the father make, her, make their children laugh. But she will be able to do something, hopefully, to alleviate part of the misery. Look, I'm all for that. Do you think... Um, Last question, just to pick up from what you've just said. Would you go further? Would you say that people with that kind of celebrity and that cultural power have an obligation? No, not at all. I mean, the job of the artist is to create good art. That's it. Create bad art and you're a lousy artist. It's like saying to a plumber, you know, can you fix my toilet, mate? And he goes, well, actually, I'm very concerned about the situation of the refugees. Do <laughs> we just fuck off and fix the toilet, you know? You know, like... <laughs> Is there an obligation to a plumber? No, but if you think that way, you know, then yeah, you know, I mean, absolutely. And loads of people don't think that way and good luck to them. And then some people try and turn them on to it, but they just say, it's not my thing. And I genuinely respect that. I mean, I've had it a lot with rock and roll people. They're just not my thing, Bob. I know it's your thing, but, you know, I don't believe it does any good, mate, you know, and everything. And, you say, and I say, fair enough. Or it's just not what I do artistically. And I don't want to use, you know, the, uh, my fame to do that, you know. What you want to use for I don't want to use it at all. That's fine. I don't even question them. I say, that's cool. Because it is cool, you know. You, you, there's absolutely no obligation uh, on you to try and turn them on to it or to do anything. But more importantly is, like, how do you alert people to the fact that things can change, that the dynamic of change is inevitable, that it is desirable, you know, that it cannot be solved through politics as more and more national politics become irrelevant and it goes to the point about the nation state. As I say, formal power resides still within the nation state at the precise moment when unilateral action by the nation state is incapable of dealing with its national problems mm. because most of the problems are global. And that's due to the inter interdependent economy and that's due to the web. And as to your point about everything becomes diffuse through the web, it doesn't become more pointed. It becomes diffuse, it evaporates, it, you know, online campaigning I think is fairly useless, you know, so what would you do this time around, Bob? Would you do another concert? No, I mean, technology was what promoted Live 8 satellites, that was the big thing. Live 8 was done through texting, that's how we got the money, so use that. But the web, I don't see it, uh, you know, I mean, disruptive technologies that destroy outdated industries also destroy outmoded logics. And, um, you know, there has to be a new way of understanding what's going on in the planet. And I'm telling you right now that, you know, as we struggle with the economy and what it is, this beast that seems to be outside our control and, and how we manage it to the benefit of our own citizens, all these things are out there, but you will not manage it and you will not have it. Uh, as, as forward uh, um, going as, as it should be unless you bring the poor into the loop. It will not happen. Bring the poor in, make these countries, uh, not us making them, but 
encouraging them to grow, helping them to grow through tiny little devices like ODA, etc., removing subsidies and tariffs, and they will have coherent institutions that can deal with their own problems. But global health problems like uh, HIV, all these things are part of the 21st century, which hasn't begun yet. The 21st century needs to begin, and we don't need it like 1914. I have an auntie, Auntie Fifi, she's 106. And um, before she went completely bonkers, which she's allowed to do at 106, um, when she was a sprightly 103, <laughs> she, um, she said to me that there was no, she has no, she had obviously been old, her memory went back now very far and was clear from that period. She has no memory or consciousness of the family being scared of any tensions in, within the family. See, I remember the Cuban Missile Crisis and this palpable fear in the house in Dunleary in Dublin. This palpable fear. And listen, constantly listening to the radio and going to a friend's house to watch telly because, you know, it was new in Ireland. And, um, and saying to my dad, what's happening? And he, sa he said, there may be a world war and if there is, the world will end. And I remember the priests and schools whispering and rushing down the aisles of the study um, during it to see what's happening. And I remember that. So Fifi said that there was no sense of the coming of the end of a world. Yet within weeks, that world ended. That entire period of culture and political history, entire systems just disintegrated in the first war. And that was the preface to the 20th, 20th century, which was a 75-year war. We still live in the year 2000, yet our century has been completely overwhelmed by this technology that's 25 years old. All our conversations seem to be to be dated and old. Our economy seems not fit for purpose. It clearly isn't. It's coll it collapses and, you know, it's robbers in, in the banks who still don't go to jail. We know their names. You know, fraud committed on a global uh, level. Uh, money sucked out of the economy um, to go to the 1% of America which are, who own 92% of that country's economic goods. I mean, it's weird. And we also live in the most fractious and vociferous moment that has been in my life, and I'm pretty old. So whether it's from Europe, whether it's Ukraine, or still Croatia, or whether it's Syria, or ISIS, or Lebanon, or Palestine, or Israel, or it's Indonesia, or it's China, or Afghanistan, or Vietnam, or Cambodia, or Burma, or Thailand, or if it's the Spratly Islands and Japan, if it's the immigrants pushing north into America, where, what does this period remind you of? It reminds me of 1914. And our systems, our political systems, don't particularly seem fit for purpose. Nor do we have the global institutions in place to deal with the 21st century, to deal with the global health problems, to deal with the interdependency, not just of health, but the economy and the systems that need to exist. We need to get our heads around what this new economy has wrought. We are in a critical period of change, a cusp moment of change, it will be discussed in 300 years, this period. One of the great glories will be that we were able to deal on a level of common humanity in some of our problems, that we would possibly be able to deal with the economy through really seriously thinking about where we're at with it. We can maybe possibly eliminate the disparities, the inequalities that lead to things like HIV AIDS that lead to all sorts of things. We're not there yet. So it's all to play for. And I think that's the exciting thing, that, that, that change constantly happening. And you live in this world, engage with it, and you can talk about it and maybe help steer it a little bit. It's a fucking hell of a ride and it's exhausting, but if you can just surf your moment, you'll crash, but it's a ride on the way. Well, it's been a hell of a ride having you here. Thanks. I think everybody's very excited about the fact and they've loved what they've just witnessed. Thank you very Cheers much. Man. Please thank Bob Garner.
Thank you very much. Thank you. Ha, ha, ha.